This is my uh, first visit to India in four years, and it's absolutely extraordinary how things have changed, how India is racing forward in many things, but especially uh, all things digital. Uh, and it's great to be here with you. Um, I thought just uh, we could start the conversation. Actually, we were we were uh, sharing some stories backstage, and one thing that I didn't know. Uh, is, you know, I've been running Uber now almost seven years. Uh, and I came to the company in a pretty tough time. The company was going through very difficult uh, cultural issues, uh, leadership transformation. Uh, before I joined, there were 14 CEOs, uh, which, you know, I'm not sure is a good thing. Uh, I'll take one CEO. But actually, during that tough time, uh, the India team here asked for some help. They needed, they needed uh, the local team uh, to, to be inspired. So they asked you, Nandan, to come into the office. Right. And you gave them a little pep talk. Tell us about that. Tell us who well, called you. Know, you yeah, I think it was just a week before you, you took charge. So we didn't know that you were coming. Uh, but uh, I, I didn't know I was coming. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I guess they, told they announced it without telling you. So, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, and I told them a story which I thought should inspire them. I said, look. I got my smartphone because of Google. And what happened, I was in New York in uh, February of 2008 or thereabouts, and I went to see a friend at NYU who was always like a geeky guy and kept track of new things. And after the meeting, he said, uh, Shall I call a cab for you? I said, Sure, but you know, I can go down and hail one. He said, No, come down. He tapped on the phone, and in two minutes, something magical appeared. And that really got me, you know, hooked on. Uber and I still use it every time I travel. In India, Thank you. I have the luxury of having a car with a driver, so I don't use it that much. But around the world, I'm on Uber. So thank you for what you guys have done. But to your thing, you know, you, you came to this company in 2017 and you know, it had all, you know, all the issues. And in seven years, you're transformed it. Market cap at an all time high. You're actually giving cash back, which is a big deal <laughs> in this world. And Different world. You really put something seven billion dollars is your plan. So how did you pull this off? Hmm. Ah, uh, it, it's a long story, and, it, and I would say that it it's been a lot of ups and downs at, at the company. But I, I do think that at the very core, I mean, you, you said it. The reason why I came to Uber, I, I've been running Expedia for thirteen years. It was a it was a great run. Was that. Uber is a product that I was very passionate about. It's a magical product. Um, it's a product that had incredible impact in the world that we live. It's 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 not just a digital only product, but it's a it's at the intersection of the digital and, and the physical. Uh, and while Uber was going through very very difficult cultural issues, the talent of the company was actually pretty extraordinary. You know, the uh, Travis, who was a founder, uh, and I know there are a lot of founders here. Listen, he had his strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and he had to push very, very hard to establish Uber in a world where I think a lot of the incumbents didn't want Uber to exist, right? Um, and that went too far sometimes. But one of his strengths was he identified and hired great talent. And so for me coming in, it was actually pretty extraordinary, which was the, the public perception of Uber versus internal who was here at the company. It was very different. It was a group of people who were incredibly passionate about the company, um, wanted to change the world, wanted to bring this digital transformation of movement uh, to, to everybody. And for me as a leader, it was just about pointing them in the right direction, which is, hey, there's absolutely, we want to you know, keep pushing this revolution, but we want to do so in the right way. And sometimes in order to speed up, you have to slow down. You have to make sure that uh, you have safety to the, uh, to the core when you're bringing on drivers and earners onto the platform. You have to think about the environment in terms of the effect of transportation on the environment, et cetera. And I think that my coming in, telling the company to slow down, think about all of our constituencies, because in some ways, yes, Uber is a private company, but it's also public good. Um, and listening to all the constituencies before you go, that really then allowed me to take this unbelievable talent base and point them in the right direction 
and the rest is theirs, you know. Now, we had to make a lot of painful decisions. Um, we had to learn how to be a profitable company. Uh, there are certain details there. Uh, but I think the company now is uh, in better shape than it ever has been. But it came because the talent base that I got to work with was extraordinary in the very first place. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fun. I'm, I'm curious, one, you know, one of the, I've been here this morning and I'm getting a brief on our business, et cetera, uh, which I always do. But, but one of the unique um, elements of, of India is this digital public infrastructure that has been built, but continues to be built on top of. Uh, you are credited with being the architect of, um, of DPI and, and all of the components there. Can you talk a, a little bit about, because this is something that is, it's unique to India. It's, it's for companies like ours to figure out how we engage here. And Uber is an active uh, engagement with the various components uh, uh, that's being built. But tell me a little bit about the why, how'd you come up with the idea, uh, and, and where do you see those building blocks going going forward? Sure. Well, actually, it began uh, uh, 15 years back, and uh, uh, I had uh, opportunity, I was invited by the government to join, to give every Indian an ID, a unique ID, which itself was a fairly, you know, quite a path-breaking idea way back in 2009. And uh, so I said, Let, let's do it. So I, I had a nice corner office, so looking at golf course in Bangalore, you know, over 100,000 employees, and I suddenly got this feel that let me go and do something. So I quit my job in Infosys, joined the government, employee number one of a startup. I mean, very more difficult than a startup, it's a startup inside a government. <laughs> so I had to put the team together, get the budget. It was like crazy stuff. And, uh, but I think, uh, and I also made the, I said, we're going to give 600 million IDs before I step down. Which wow. Everybody said, you're crazy to make commitments like that. But I needed a unifying goal for everyone. So that's how I ended up in the uh, Aadhaar world. And today, of course, 1.3 billion people have an ID and it's used 80 million times a day for authentication, KYC and so on. And then we also... We, what, we said, what are the use cases of this ID which make it compelling? And it had to be a digital ID, so it's an mm -hmm. ID on the online ID. So we came up with one authentication, verify who the person is. And that turned out to be a very useful thing in many, many applications. And we gave it as an API. So we realized that innovation has to happen outside. We had to have build the rails on which innovation happens. Something how the internet or GPS happened. They, they were built as rails on which innovation could happen. Mm -hmm. So we took the same principle. And uh, the another use case was KYC or know your customer. And you know, to open a bank account or to get a mobile connection, you need uh, both these things. And we came up with a way to collapse the time of a KYC from uh, days to minutes, you know, which, which by the way you use for driving. We do, we do, yeah. I presume, yeah. So then the big thing happened was one was when Prime Minister Modi came in, he went on a massive financial inclusion journey with the Jandan Yojana program. So they used Aadhaar KYC to open hundreds and millions of bank accounts. And Mukesh Ambani came with Reliant Geo and he used Aadhaar KYC to get hundreds of millions of customers. Suddenly you had a situation where everybody had an ID, everybody had a bank account, everybody had a mobile phone. And these are the three basic tools that people could use. And then over the last 10 years, there have been layers and layers of stuff built on that, UPI and FastTag and all that. And it's all coming together. And as you rightly said, we feel we are only halfway on the journey. There's still stuff coming down the pipe. And I think at the end of this, it will be really quite something to see. But it, it, it's a very unusual approach for a government or government-sponsored entity to build out these open protocols. So did you, was the government not that focused so you got to do whatever the heck you wanted? Or was there, was there, you know, convincing? Because it, it is, it is a very unusual approach that, that in yeah, state. Yes, look at it this way. The, the internet was funded by the U.S. government. Yeah. GPS was funded by the U.S. government. And they were open protocols. So it's not that we're creating a new model. They already existed in the U.S. So we just took that approach. To so use the inter internet 
No, we use the it's architecture it's of creating a public rail on yeah. which private innovation could happen. It was essentially modeled on the internet and GPS. But the fact is, the government had this policy of doing an ID. Our value add was, let's make it a digital ID. Mm -hmm. you know, it was 2009, you know, might as well make it a digital ID. So I think, uh, I think it was very supportive. I think we had uh, government changes. Everybody is supportive. I think because, I think people realize that uh, if you really want to solve India's problems at scale, you need digital rails which will enable things to happen. Uh, for example, today India does the world's largest direct benefit transfer. So you just have to press a button and money goes into people's bank accounts at scale. Okay. During COVID, yeah, the, the, the US could have used that during yeah, yeah. COVID. So. <laughs> they were sending checks in the mail and all. So uh, that, they realize the power of these things. So I think, and you know, Prime Minister Modi is a very tech savvy person. So he fully appreciates and supports it. Uh, but I want to get back to you on, you know, within a couple of years of joining, COVID happened. Yes. And COVID was about people, I mean, when COVID happened, people didn't leave their homes. So they didn't need to go anywhere. Mobility was not a business anymore. So how did you survive that one? Uh, 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 with some difficulty. So it, it's, you know, I do think that sometimes the worst things that could happen to the company in hindsight could be the best things. You know, with, with COVID, we were at the time losing uh, $3 billion uh, in terms of profitability, if you want to call it that. Uh, and our mobility business was a cash cow of the business, and we were using mobility to fund the delivery business. Delivery eats was, was just a promise. And overnight, we lost 85% of our volumes uh, when, when COVID happened. And um, I still remember actually the first time I heard about COVID, we were about to have an offsite, management offsite, and we heard about three passengers in Mexico getting COVID. And then uh, we got some details. I killed the offsite, everyone got to go home, et cetera. But we lost 85% of, of our volumes, and uh, that required a lot of soul searching. We have been a company that was completely focused on expansion. Uh, and we had to retrench. Uh, and it, it really forced us as a company to decide what is the core value that Uber brings and then what's non-core. So there were businesses that we were in. We were building um, uh, bikes and scooters, e-bikes and scooters. We were building autonomous technology, et cetera, uh, vertical takeoff landing uh, products. We had to painfully get out of those businesses. And... and about, uh, we had to do a layoff of a quarter of our population, which was incredibly painful. I never thought I'd come to Uber to lay people off. Like, you know, it's a, it's a growth company. But I think that event um, really caused the company to double down on what we do, which is build these giant managed marketplaces that bring, you know, demand for transportation and supply for transportation together in a very artful, easy way. You know, the pricing, the matching, all of it uh, driven by ML, et cetera. It really forced us to double down on what we do well. Um, we got either, we were smart or lucky in that our Uber Eats business exploded. <laughs> so a lot of our drivers who no longer had, uh, had earnings opportunities, they moved over to Eats. And we really started uh, building the Eats business in a huge way. Uh, and and you know we survived. We we did what we uh, had to do. Burn in those two years. Uh, we um, well we went from a three billion burn to a five billion burn if we didn't make cuts. But then we took it back down to three billion burn. Um, fortunately, we had a lot of money in the bank. You know, one of the lessons for the for the founders mm -hmm. here: always have more in the bank than you think you you need, because you never ever know what's going to happen to you. Uh, and thank God we that raised more. Was that because you raised capital? We raised we raised capital in the in the IPO, and and we raised way more capital than we ever thought we need. Except we need it, <laughs> you know. And and then we we came out of COVID. I think because of the eats business, and because after COVID we really started focusing on the needs of our drivers and earners. Before COVID, I would say just being self-critical, we took our drivers for granted to some extent. Uh, we were generally oversupplied, et cetera, and we were much more of a consumer-focused company, and the, cons the, the customer who 
was the rider or the eater was always right. And the customer became for us the driver. And we really started focusing on the driver needs. What are their needs? The onboarding, uh, uh, everything that they need for us to build a platform that's fair to both sides. And ultimately with Uber, the power of Uber is the six and a half million earners who are on our platform and the services that they provide for everybody. So that allowed us to come out of COVID stronger than ever. Um, and the discipline, you know, the, the other lesson for us is there's in, in, in technology, and it's a, it, it's, it's a bit of a twisted view, which is engineering teams often, they identify the size of their teams with their value. You know, if you have a 20 person team, you want to then lead a 30 person team. If you have a 30 person team, you want to lead a 50 person team. If you have a 50 person team, you want to lead a 100 person team, et cetera. Right? So the more, the bigger your team, the better. And because we had to focus on cost so much, the heroes became the ones who could do great things with 10 people and who didn't ask for more people. And so the, the whole mentality of the company became different and it became about, you know, doing more with less, working smarter. Uh, and coming out of COVID now, you know, we really are a platform. It is about mobility and delivery. Um, not in India, we're just mobility. It breaks my heart, but still, uh, around the world, we're about mobility, mobility and delivery. And I think, you know, our best days are ahead of us. But that, that was, I never, ever want to go through that experience again. Amazing. But in hindsight, it was... Uh, and is it true that you wear a cap and dark glasses and actually do the Uber duty once in a while? Yeah, you know, I, uh, it, it was actually, d during the pandemic, I was, I was going crazy at home. So I wanted to get out of the house, so I bought an e-bike and I started delivering food uh, for Uber Eats. And, and you know, it, it, it preserved my sanity during those dark days. Uh, and I didn't own a car. After, after, you know, COVID was over, I bought a Tesla. And so I drive the Tesla as a Uber driver. I'm Dara K. If you ever see me on the road, please give me five stars. I don't drive here, but uh, but I, I wore a mask because I, I didn't want people to recognize me, et cetera. It was, it was just about the experience. And, and that, again, um, really helped me identify with the earners and the drivers. Uh, and it helped us build better product. Uh, so it was, it was, uh, it was, those are dark, dark days, but you know, it's the test of, any great entrepreneur, it's it's not how you do on your best days, it's, it's how do you do on your worst days. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the best are the ones who they, they fight through the worst days so that when the good day comes, you know, it's easy to succeed during the good days. And do you feel that driver loyalty uh, happened with all the things you did? And I, think, I think, you know, we have to earn driver loyalty every day, every single minute. But I think that our drivers saw us as a platform that was dependable for them, that listened to them, and was fair. Uh, but every single day, you know, the nature of the earner economy and flexible earnings is you have to re, re earn that loyalty every single day. And it's about making money. Uh, and it's about making money in a fair way where the ecosystem is an ecosystem that makes, that makes sense for everybody. That's good. Now, uh, tell me a little bit about. Um, you know, coming back to DPI and the and, and the ecosystem that we're trying to build in, in India as a as a private company, uh, we've got size, we've got scale. We, to some extent, have built our own called the private protocols. You know, uh, 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 the demand and the supply and the managed marketplace that, that we've built at Uber. How do you think private companies should think about engaging in the digital infrastructure and the open protocols that are being built here? You know, how, how do you, especially, I can see especially smaller players wanting to engage in the ecosystem because, you know, if you got demand, it can bring free supply, et cetera. But for the larger players, the Ubers, the Googles, the Facebooks, et cetera, how do you think we should look at engaging in this in the in this ecosystem, and and how do you build? You know, ultimately we want it to public good, but we're private companies sure. that have to earn capital. Yeah. How should we look at this opportunity? No, I think uh, DPI has been built for enabling innovation, whether it's large players or whether it's startups. So we make sure that it's it's a level playing field for everyone to use. But it varies from company to company because of their business, right? So if you look at Google, uh, Google's very successful product is uh, Google Pay, yeah. which is uh, you know among the top two products on, on UPI. And they've done an amazing job with that. So they 
embraced it and they built this and in fact uh, they, they've been talking about it in other parts of the world because you know, they, they, they found it so useful. Specifically for Uber, I think there are three or four things. One is of course payments. Uh, you know, I think if you remember in the early days, it was all cash on delivery and people fumbling around cash, then you give the cash a driver, then he has to give it to you. It was all, now it's all UPI based. And uh, so I think a significant part of the payments today, I, I assume, are UPI based. And then you can also, you know, with UPI Lite, uh, you have a single factor authentication with a 500 rupees, so you can just, you can just walk out and the payment happens. And uh, you can set up an auto instruction so that you, know, you don't have to do it every time. You just set up saying every time my Uber payment is below 1000 yes. rupees, do an auto debit. So there are a whole host of things which I think has made life easier on the payment side. Similarly, uh, the driver verification. Uh, I think the fact that you have an Aadhaar KYC, DigiLocker, which is another great product built by the government, keeps documents on the drivers, verified documents like your driver's license, vehicle registration. So it dramatically reduces the cost of verification of credentials, both of your driver as well as the vehicle which is driving. That's huge use. Yes. Then you talk about this intercity service. Uh, all our highways have fast tag. Uh, so you can, you know, instead of waiting for a long time at the toll gate, you just drive through and debits the account. So fast tag is another big productivity benefit uh, for Uber. So you know, I look at all this stuff. I think uh, tomorrow when the AI comes, uh, AI in Indian languages, then you know your, your drivers can get all the instructions in Indian language, which or the language of their choice. So I think everything in the stack of uh, India is actually valuable for different players for different. Uh, benefits. And then of course there's the ODC framework where you know as an incumbent you may not you may decide not to be a ODC because of other reasons. But if you want to do adjacencies, you want mm -hmm. to get back into Uber Eats, I wish you should. You know, I don't know why you're not doing that. Rob, oh, I'll talk to my board about your advice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so get back into Uber Eats and I think uh, in general even grocery <laughs> delivery I think they hold yeah. Yeah. Uh, delivery system is waiting for someone to crack it at scale and speed, which you guys know so well. So there are a ton of things. You can use what's already there, you can do what's coming. But, I, by the way, the ecosystem of companies that have created value around DPR runs into maybe $100 billion. So it's not, you know, it's, people have actually built real companies on top of this. So it's, it's very much there and I think you guys can embrace it fully. I, and I would say, we, we are embracing it in various ways. Um, the One of the strategic opportunities, the biggest strategic opportunities for Uber is for us to expand in the low cost space, right? It's, you know, Uber now, it's, we have been historically more four wheelers and it has historically been a product. You know, originally Uber, when, when Travis and Garrett founded the Uber, it was uh, in the streets of pa Paris, you know, they wanted to have a black car. So the business, kind of the core of the business came from high-end luxury goods, right? But actually, if you look now, for us, the, the single biggest opportunity that we're very passionate about is lower cost products. Three-wheelers, two-wheelers, uh, we're building a service with robust high-capacity vehicles that are that work for longer distances that maybe a two-wheeler or three-wheeler doesn't. So for us, low cost is an extraordinary opportunity. It's also an extraordinary opportunity for us to expand our services to a wider swath of the population. You know, we don't want to just be a uh, upper middle class product. We want to be available for, for everybody. Uh, and the rails that you're building in terms of you know one of our largest costs is bring onboarding uh, earners onto the platform. Uh, in the West uh, many times it'll take two weeks to get someone on, you know, all of the various uh, cases, etc. Here in India, we have certain circumstances where drivers have uploaded all the documents. It can be, you know, almost instantaneous. It can be within the day. And the faster an earner says, I want to earn flexibly on the platform and everything is taken care of, the higher the conversion. So for us, we're very interested in these kinds of products, and the same thing in terms of payments, uh, having low-cost payments methods for a two-wheeler or three-wheeler, or you know these buses that we're looking look to build, these bus services that we're looking to build, is incredibly important. 
because the cost of payments can become, especially you know, with the Visa or Mastercard in the West, uh, is is enormous. It's an enormous part of our business. So uh, we're we're rooting not only for the this ecosystem to thrive in India, but especially in developing countries elsewhere. You know, this model expands elsewhere. It'll be, I think, I think a win for society. But also win for Uber too, and that's that's you right. know a big part of my job. If you can become a global champion and evangelist for India's DPI, we'd be grateful. Yes, yes, we we, we will. I mean, it, it is. It, I think it's a good thing for the world, but it's also um, in our interest too. Yeah. You know, frankly speaking. There are one, one of the things you when you came back to Uber was you brought focus. You know, they I think they're doing everything, right? Yes. Yeah. And you systematically and ruthlessly, if I may say. Trimmed all that stuff and went back to basics. You know, I'm nicely ruthless. I'm not mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you did it nicely, I'm sure, but you did it with you know, with the clarity. So what what did you you said? Let's get back to basics. What was your yeah? This, I think it, it's it's very easy. I always tell my team it's it's very easy to say yes. Let's try this. Let's try that, etc. But to me, actually, the the greatest thing as a company is when you say no to a really good idea. No, the founders. Yeah. No, because, because listen, if you if you say no to a really good idea, it means that the ideas that you're saying yes to are even better. Okay. So you should celebrate the no's, right? Strategy isn't just about especially for larger companies like ours, etc. Strategy isn't about just what you do; it's about what you say no to. You know, look at one of the greatest founders that uh, you know, technology founder Steve Jobs. You know, he he was the the greatest no person. And by the way, no's hard. Right, because it's always fun to go after the next opportunity, the next opportunity. And, and I will tell you, it, it was um, it was a learning opportunity for me. Right, I had said yes to too many things, and I think in hindsight, uh, we lived at the time in the zero interest rate world. Zerp, zerp. Yeah, the the zerp world, where you know everyone was saying yes to everything, and I do think that some companies, including Uber, we got caught in chasing our own valuation, right? So the value, you know, so we were, I was trying to manufacture ways to catch up to the expectations that others had of us. Seen that movie here. Yeah. And, and, you know, COVID kind of made the music stop. Yeah. And at that point, then we had to say, what is it that we are truly passionate? What, what are the, what are the side gigs? Let's let someone else do that. Someone else can be passionate about that. What is it? What's the core of what we do? And, and the core of what we do are these managed marketplaces, you know, bringing, you know, hundreds of millions of people looking for mobility, matching them up with the six and a half million earners uh, and, and, and everything that has to go in and in terms of the routing, the matching, the pricing, etc. And we can do that better than anyone else. And then there, there are some adjacencies, right? Going from uh, going from mobility to delivery, going from delivery to grocery, uh, building an advertising business on top of it, going from four wheelers to three wheelers to, to two wheelers. So we are still quite expansionist as a company and we are still very ambitious as a company, but the ambition should be where you're absolutely passionate, where you're going to be the best, the best, the best in terms of what you do. And then, of course, there'll be an ecosystem around you. But if you're trying to be good at everything, you're not going to be good at anything. One thing I talk about is autonomous cars. Yes. I remember 10 years back, whenever it was, Uber said we'll make autonomous cars and yeah. guys made that famous statement about the guy in the front seat. So you went and had the whole team from Carnegie Mellon, the whole autonomous yes. team from Carnegie We did. We did. Very talented team. And then you had to, you know, cut that out. That's one thing. But also, where do you see that? Because Autonomous cars have the potential to transform your business. Very much so. Very, and, and for us, the promise of autonomous, ultimately, it goes to what I started with, which is lowering the cost of transportation, yeah. making it available to, for everybody, and, and also making it safe. You yeah. know, that is the promise of autonomous. And, and we are quite supportive of the autonomous ecosystem. Uh, we work with Waymo. We work with a number of autonomous players out there, uh, Aurora, uh, to essentially bring our demand because listen these autonomous players they're putting billions of dollars into building the technology they need demand and, and that's where that's where we come in 
I do think that there's, I'm curious as to what you think, you work with governments here in MD, is um, the technology is slowly but surely improving. I would tell you that I believe that autonomous drivers now are better than the average human driver, but not better than every human driver. Uh, and I do think that society is quite comfortable with humans making mistakes. Humans are allowed to make mistakes all the time, you know? We're human after all. But robots are not allowed to make mistakes, right? So um, the, the standards that autonomous is going to be measured by are very different than the standards that humans are going to be measured by. Uh, and that's that's both a societal challenge and for us, you know, when we offer a ride to you on Uber, we know that driver is safe. We know we've done a background check on that driver. You know, they, there are things we know about that driver. and We're going to match you up with a good driver. Uh, and so we as a company also have to make sure that if we match you up with a robot driver, we match you up with a good, safe robot driver. Um, that definition uh, is accepted publicly, you know, licensing, etc. So the government is taking care of that. But with autonomous, the rules are still very much undetermined. I'm curious as to what you think, like, I mean, because yeah. you've been involved with public, private, etc. Yeah. Well, let me say that, first of all, after you figure out how to make it drive in San Francisco, you need another 10 years to make it drive here. Yeah. <laughs> the chaos is so much higher. The training needs of that autonomous vehicle is going to be much more. So I'm not sure. Yeah. I'll worry about it after you guys have cracked it in the US. But I agree with you. I think people have accidents all the time. And, uh, you know, India has 160,000 deaths per year due to automobile. But even if there's one episode with an autonomous vehicle, it, you know, it goes all over. Like happened in Chicago. Bruce, yeah. But the other thing I want to ask you is, is it also a threat? Because let's say if I'm Waymo or, or Cruise or Tesla, I can also launch a service which is only autonomous. So what does that mean for you? I, I think it's both a threat and an opportunity. It absolutely could be a threat. Uh, but I think our hypothesis, it goes to what you and I were talking about earlier, is what are you great at? Okay. You know, and, and I do think one is that anyone who builds out uh, an autonomous service they're just not going to have enough cars initially to provide the fulsomeness of the service. You know, it's got to be available anytime, anywhere. Yeah, the liquidity. Yeah, so, so liquidity. So having a hybrid service that has, you know, if, if you're making a hail, understands is there an autonomous car near you, is there a human near you, etc., and provides you with a really safe, reliable service, we can essentially help those companies bridge into the future. Uh, and so I do think that, and, and a lot of these companies, listen, this, this problem has turned out to be more difficult than anyone imagined. Remember, those days people thought by 29 Yeah, years, not, absolutely. So I, I, I think that ultimately we can be a compliment. No, right? I, I agree. I think the ability to bring it in gradually is actually your strength. Yes. They have, because they have to go full or nothing, and that's not going to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. we're, we're, again, we're working with the whole ecosystem, but it's, uh, it's turned out to be a tougher nut to crack. And we're, we're working not only with passenger mobility, we have Uber Freight, so trucking, for example, is a very large autonomous use case. It's simpler, highway driving, et cetera. And the same thing with delivery, which is, you know, if you have a passenger and you have a robot car who's conservative, is gonna be very difficult, is, is gonna drive more slowly or not want to take that left turn, you know, a passenger is gonna get impatient, a big pack isn't gonna get impatient, they'll, they'll wait. Customer. Uh, yeah, exactly. the customer may, may get impatient as well. So we've covered all of the use cases of autonomous, which makes us, I think, um, a pretty good client. Okay, great. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. Like we talked about um, uh, DPI and how, you know, the more I hear about it, the more I get excited about uh, it, it expanding. And I think we're out of time, so this will be the last question for you. It, it expanding all around the world. What... How do you think governments should think about, you know, again, and I'll come back to it's very unusual for a government to sponsor an open protocol. So there are dangers there, there are concerns there. Um, how, do you, what, how do you think governments should think about what are the dangers there, what are the issues? And then as, as we're sponsoring, you know, DPI all, all, all over the world, 
What, what are those key issues that we have to make sure governments are satisfied with? Well, I think, first of all, in a digitally intensive world, digitally intense world, we need to have uh, some rails that are available to all. If you want to get a truly inclusive uh, society, if you want everyone to be in, and you value the same thing, you want to make Uber everybody's mobility. Absolutely. Uh, so, you need to have these kind of things. And uh, what we're finding is that it's not just about technology, it's about inclusive growth, it's about economic growth. India is you know, growing very quickly, part of it is because of the GPI. So I think governments are, are getting it. The question is how to, not, not in the how, the how also has been solved. But you know, the politics is a very complex space, as, as you know. And therefore it's really, uh, that's the challenge that people have to deal with. But I think it is going to come, it's an idea whose time has come and with your support it will go Yeah, how do you think private companies can help? Private companies, by demonstrating or talking about how well they benefited from it, like you know, we talked about all the things. So it's, it's we are very clear that this is not some kind of a government uh, services thing. It's about enabling public rates for private innovation and letting markets innovate and flourish in a way that it creates competition, innovation and so on. It's, it's very clear. So I think, and you know, everybody with the incumbent like you or the startup, they're all going to benefit. All these guys are benefiting from it. Awesome. Do we have time for a uh, rapid fire or, uh, yeah? All right, so here's a rapid fire. I've got some questions for you. Are you ready? All right, yeah. All right. Who has been the biggest influence on you other than me? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, my uh, my co-founder and leader, Narayan Murthy, is one. And, uh, yeah, Bill Gates also is very supportive. That's pretty good. One superpower you wish you had? Uh, I wish I was more ambitious. <laughs> That's quite a statement, especially with this crowd. Why are you not on any instant messaging app? I don't, I find all of them are completely waste of time. So I just, and if somebody wants to reach me, they can't. Just don't build any instant messaging apps here at Founders. What accomplishment that you're most proud of? I think the two big things, big part of Infosys and transforming India's private sector and of course, Contributing to Aadhaar and building India's DPI, both these things. It's awesome. Uh, people describe you in a lot of ways. Tech visionary, digital evangelist, India's chief tech strategist. Which out of these is closest to who you are? I don't know. I actually don't do anything wrong with the visionary part. I like that. I like that. Uh, and then um, last one. What's your favorite work day time waster? What gets you distracted? Sleep. Other than... Other than uh, uh, Instant messaging. Sleep. Sleep? Very good. I'll take it. Wait, Excellent. I want to ask you. You know, one person we both know is Barry Diller. Yes. You work with Barry. I know Barry will give a pledge. So what have you learned from Barry Diller? Um, the, you know, the, the most important lesson that, that I learned from uh, Barry Diller is that it's the job of the leader to lead by doing the exceptional. I still remember one, one advice that Barry gave me is, uh, I went through a plan with my team. I wanted to go through with a plan. And, and he said, Dara, I didn't hire you to be average. You know, because I didn't want to leave my team down. And he's like, your team's recommendation is the average recommendation of all their teams. You know what's wrong. You've got to, you know, there are times when the leader go with the team and there are times where the leader has to be exceptional and has to go off the norm. So he, he, you know, Barry's fearless. And when I first started working with him, I was a little fearful. Uh, and, you know, all of us need a little fearlessness, all these founders over here. And, and he taught me to be fearless when, when, you know, times are tough. How do you, how do you keep learning and adapting? Like, I saw you in the meeting today, you're very intense. You're very curious about things. How do you do that? Uh, I love listening. You know, I, I think that one of the... Um, really underrated skills, but there, there, there are all kinds of courses on presentation skills, how to present. I've never seen a skill in business school on how to listen. <laughs> and I think good. listening is a really underrated ability. Like it's, it's I, I, I take it in, I'm a sponge. I, so much of what I've learned in my life is based on listening to others. So we talked about autonomous cars. When do you think we'll have a world without drivers? Never. Never? Oh, okay. That's good. 
Okay. And when you go in the Uber as a customer, yes. do you talk to the drivers? Oh yeah. I what definitely check. What do you ask them about? Usually, I, I actually, the, um, most drivers are immigrants like me, so I love immigrant stories. I came from Iran yeah. uh, when I was nine years old. Family lost everything. We rebuilt our life in, in the U.S. So I just ask them where they're from. And usually then they tell me their stories. Yeah, a couple of minutes before I, I get there, I say, you know, how's Uber going for you? You know, do you like it? Do you not like it? Etc. cetera. Uh, so I try to get my a little bit of Uber goodness right at the end. But usually the best question is, where are you from? And do you tell them what you do? Um, if I usually don't, uh, some of them recognize me. If they recognize me, I tell them. So you're an immigrant leading other immigrants. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and finally, what is so exciting about Uber in India? Um, it, the I think that India is one of the toughest markets out there. It is, you know, the Indian customer is so demanding and doesn't want to pay for anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, if I view if Uber can make it in India, and I would say, like, our team is really making it here. This is, this is the best of times for Uber in India. I'm so proud of the team. But India is the gateway to the world for us. This is, this is the toughest market to succeed in. But if we succeed in here, that sets a standard for us to succeed in so many other markets. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take a selfie, hold on. Okay. i got to get this for... Uh... Yeah, can you guys say, we got to see you in the background. All right. Let's see. Uh, see. Yeah, okay, good to see you. Say hi, everyone.